You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Monster House presents. Monster Talk is proud to be a part of the Airwave Media family, home of such shows as Fork in the Road, Small Things Often, and Therapist Uncensored. If you'd like to advertise on this show, contact sales at advertisecast.com. It's actually quite unlike anything we've ever seen before. A giant hairy creature, part ape, part man. In Loch Ness, a 24-mile-long bottomless lake in the highlands of Scotland, it's a creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. Monster Talk. Welcome to Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. I'm Blake Smith. And I'm Karen Stolzner. Ah, the good old days. We first talked with Ken Fader back in 2010 on episode 10, which was titled Fee Fi Fo Fum. It was all about giants, from biblical giants to the Cardiff giant. And, well, our giants, if you think about it. Anyway, since then, he's been back several times and always a treat. And I was greatly surprised to see that he'd recorded and released an entire web series about archaeological frauds and hoaxes, which I know many of you are going to want to go binge on. So not only do you get his terrific teaching style, but unlike this humble podcast, you can actually see his passionate delivery and watch his face light up as he talks about these fascinating mysteries and how we know which hypotheses are likely to be true and which can be discarded despite how popular they may be on the History Channel. Now, some of you may be disappointed that Ken doesn't talk like a sailor on this episode. I haven't asked him why, but in the intervening gap between his last visit and this one, he's sort of filled his house up with a delightful bunch of little people that might very well have impacted the frequency of his foul-mouthedness. That's just my own hypothesis. Who knows? Could it have been aliens? I mean, who f***ing knows? Anyway, without further ado, let's go talk to Ken Fader. Monster Dog. So we're here to talk about your new YouTube series, and I was really surprised, like, uh, to see this. It was, it's like, it's already there. It's ready to go. People can hop in and catch all the episodes. Uh, I don't know if you'll be doing more, but 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 right now you've got a complete series out there ready to go. This is uh, ten episodes. Ten episodes exposing hoaxes, busting myths, and solving mysteries from History Colorado. That's really cool. Yeah. Now you're not from Colorado, so I guess. Yeah. Aside- did you yeah. come out here to film it, or you just? No, no. I did this. Them? I did this from my office at home. There's, there's a, a story about this. This was all just sort of, you know, we we seated our pants. Let's see how we can do this. Let's see how many we could do. Let's see how long they could be. Let's get some folks, professionals, to actually record it. And we just went, went along and. I'm really pleased with, with how it ended up. It looks great. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I've watched yeah, a yeah, little yeah. bit. I, I can't wait to watch some more. It's really I, fun. Well, Listen, I, do you want my long-winded background for how this all came about? I think that's what people are paying yeah. for, Ken. I think, right. yeah. <laughs> so it all starts in 1978, actually, um, when I was the when I was a first year instructor at university. The first time I had courses. That were given to me. Said, Ken, you, you design the courses, you teach the courses, you grade the kids, um, and I was fresh out of grad school. And one of the things that I think people find surprising is that, at least in my day, there were no courses in grad school about how to teach. And most of us were going to go into teaching along with research. And so it was just sort of see to your pants, man. They, they they throw you in the deep end, as the cliche goes. So okay, teach a class, and. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I'm not sure I know what I'm doing now, but I certainly didn't know what I was doing back in the day. Um, and I, I didn't. There were no. I had no role models. In fact, I, the one role model I had was kind of kind of the opposite role model. You know, I was just looking at other people before I before I actually started teaching at the at the university. I looked in on other classes, you know, from and walk by classrooms and see how profs were 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 doing their thing. And there was this one guy. 
Um, and I'm not going to mention names. He's long dead, but it's uh, you know he was not he was not the most enthusiastic or entertaining professor. Uh, and he was actually he was a really weird dude. He used to dress in like 1940s gray suits and gray overcoats and like little pork pie hats. And he just we started traveling. calling him <laughs> by his name, you know, his first name, comma. The undead. Because we were convinced he was a vampire. <laughs> Fair now, enough. When, when I would walk by one of his classes that first, the first semester, and I would see, I'd make eye contact with the students in the class, and the look of quiet desperation in the eyes of those students was chilling. Because this mm. guy would walk into a class. I don't think he would even acknowledge the fact that there were people there. He would sit down, put his hand on the desk, and open a three-ring binder, and then never look up from that binder and simply read his class notes. Oh. So it was like it was a script. That's and it the was, worst. <laughs> and listen, Tales was, from the script. But, <laughs> but here's the deal. My, here's my, my fantasy, Blake and Karen, was that one day I would walk by that room and look in and see these students. And the students would have this blank expression. And they would, as if by some silent command, while their professor is, is speaking, they would all rise up out of their chairs. And you know that, that horror movie trope where, like, demons and ghosts don't actually walk like a person, but they glide? Yes, they, yes. They, film them, they must put them on, like, a skateboard or something. Yeah. yeah. It's really creepy. So in my, in my fantasy... The stu- I'm watching as these students, I- I'm amazed, they just kind of glide towards the the desk where he's sitting, and they surround him. And meanwhile, th- his voice never v- is muffled, but he never stops because he has no idea what's going on because he's not looking up from his notes. Uh-huh. And then I hear this hum, and eventually he stops lecturing, and there's a muffled scream. <laughs> and then the students all look up, the hum stops. And they become humans again, and they walk out of the room, and I look over to the desk, and he's not there. And I walk in, and I see there's the three-ring binder, and on the chair is just a little ashy residue. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I thought to Uh, myself, with that fantasy, I never want to be that guy. (laughs) Yeah, Fair enough. Great example yeah. of what not to do. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. It was kind of opposite. It was the opposite mm. lesson. And it was kind of at that moment that I thought, you know what? The best model I have for how to keep 25 or 35 or 40 or 100 people entertained is stand-up comedy. You know, <laughs> those guys, those men and women are able to capture an audience, convey some information to them, right? Unless mm-hmm. it's pure slapstick, and have them – Really think about it and be entertained by it, and there's and there's recognition. And, oh yeah, yeah, that's oh I did never do that, and that became my model. I was a, I I was stand up comic, and here's the here's the thing. I used to tell people there's a fa- there's a an old expression called that that goes a false modesty is no modesty at all, and it turns out that's not an old expression. I guess I made it up, <laughs> <laughs> or I heard it somewhere. And, <laughs> What I'm going to tell you now sounds like I'm a pompous ass. No, I am a pompous ass, <laughs> but that's that's irrelevant. I I w- I got really really good as a lecturer and as a public speaker. I'm more out of fear than anything else because I did not want my students to evaporate me and be an ashy <laughs> residue at the, <laughs> at the front of an auditorium. That scared the hell out of me. So I didn't want that to happen. So I thought, listen. You know, I can that and that every lecture became like a stand up where I understood I had to gauge the audience's reaction, what was working or what wasn't working. I had to ad lib a lot of stuff as new th- as as people asked questions and as people reacted. Um, and I got really good. I, you know, like I won a teaching award. Hooray for me. But the, the point here is that I got I, I know that I got really good at that and I liked it a lot. And I miss it. I actually miss not going into a classroom and teaching. But here's the thing. Here's here's the I think one of the saddest parts for me about teaching was that I would do a lecture. I'd be and you know they weren't all great, but I would be really pleased at the end of a lecture, and then recognize it has it's gone. It's evanescent. That it's it it will never be. I'll never give that lecture again in the same way. I'll never have the same reaction in the same way. It's like. 
how do you preserve that? How do you save that? And I remember frequently thinking, well, someday I'm going to get the, our communications department or our, our uh, AV people to record my lectures because, you know, now, Blake and Karen, I don't want to shock you. But it turns out I am not immortal. What? <laughs> so there will come a day. You know, I used to tell my students when I would, in my intro archaeology class, I would talk about dating methods in archaeology, obviously. First of all, don't lead with your archaeologist because you're not going to get a date that way. That's, uh, yep. <laughs> you know, as I'm speaking, the voice in the back of my head said, don't give, don't give Blake that. Don't, 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 don't do that. Uh, take it away from him. Anyway, and one of the things I would tell the kids is that that very often now when you open an archaeology text or a history text or a, or a, a prehistory text, that people, instead of using B.C. or A.D., which, of course, are based on the, the, the birth of Christ, who is not everybody's son of God, who is not everybody's God incarnate, and that's sort of weird. So so people use B.P. for before present or, or B.C. E is before the common era, and a bunch of ways of doing that. And then I tell them that I have my own method of 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 uh, of uh, conveying dates. I have uh, BF, which is before Fader. <laughs> when we are now living, by the way, in the DF times uh, during mm-hmm. Fader, and mm-hmm. you'll be able to tell your grandchildren back back in the golden age DF. I I lived through that. And then, but that sadly, there will come a time when there will be an AF, you know, after Fader, and and and, uh, and and it's true, and so this was always sort of this thing in the back of my mind that oh shit, you know, these lectures are great, but but nobody's going to remember them. Or my students who remember them, well, they're all going to die, and so it's just this this moment in time when I was able to do that, and that's what, and so that's just in the back of my mind, and so yeah. I don't know, it was a year ago. Holly Norton, Dr. Holly Norton, who is uh, an archaeologist in Colorado, uh, state archaeologist in, in the, the Department of Department of Office of State Archaeology and Historic Preservation, and we're Facebook friends. You know, so I've never met her, uh, but we talk. You know, I would comment on something she would say, and she would comment on something I would say. And at some point, she wrote me an email, or maybe it was a, a you know a iMessage or whatever the hell it was, saying, "Hey Ken, would you ever be interested?" And doing a series of lectures, we have a little bit of funding uh, on your, you know, frauds, myths, and mysteries in archaeology. And I thought, wow, that sounds really cool. And we, we mm. back and forth. I, I've had a life now where I, I can't like go out to Colorado for a month and tape a bunch of lectures. Uh, but I told her, you know, look, to make this super simple, I can effectively give ten of the lectures that I get would give in my. Um, uh, my class, in which I use my book, Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries, Science and Pseudoscience and Archaeology. That's Oxford University Press. Go and buy a copy. Um, going into its goddamn 11th edition. So it's like first wow. edition, 1990. Uh, oh, that's impressive. I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I will say that uh, I, I know you have your favorite review of your book. But uh, I tell people that there's more uh, good scientific content – on the cover of that book than an entire <laughs> season of anything on the History Channel. And, and well, uh, you know, I don't sure. know if that's still being printed the same way, but the edition I have has all these facts and information on the cover. It's like, it's not a joke. It's like for real. It's, the inside, yeah, the inside y- cover yeah. is that it's kind of a, uh, a list of do's and don'ts in mm-hmm. science altogether, but archaeology especially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, my, fa- my favorite review was, Fader's uh, Fader's book is filled with humor. It's like giving a dog a pill wrapped in cheese. Yep. <laughs> it is, you, you're never going to get a better oh, review I love than it. that, especially if you like cheese. And I, I like cheese. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, so this series then that, that you've done is a, a great chance for those who've never been a student of yours to see you in action. Yeah, that's – and that's – look, it's a real ego stroke. It is. I mean I'll probably get you know all kinds of things – people saying horrible things about me, and that's fine. Whatever. You know, you're not going to bother me. But, but 
the 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 response, the feedback I'm getting so far are probably from people who are fans anyway, who who use read my book or know me or know my work, and so it's, that's been really positive, and I fully expect to get you know really bad blowback too. And it's, it's it is what it is. If you don't, if you got a, if you have better better stuff to say about this, make your own YouTube show or Netflix show, sure. and that happens, yeah. and so and, and we're fine with it. Um, so so. So when, when I took that opportunity, I said, Holly, this is a great idea. But what we're going to have to do is I, if I can do it from my home office and effectively do my, you know, 10 of my lectures, however many from my, my course, which represents p- chapters in the frauds book, that would be great. Now, coincidentally, I have done two of these uh, two lectures, one based on. The Cardiff Giant and one not one one actually based on the archaeology of Sherlock Holmes and the archaeology in the Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, fifty six short stories and four novels, and I had done those already for Kathy Barr. Kathy's this wonderful colleague, a brilliant woman, and she's the director of the P.T. Barnum Museum in Bridgeport. Nice and. She has, I won't say single-handedly because she will yell at me if I say single-handedly, but she has preserved the integrity of that museum after it was hit by a tornado, a tornado in Bridgeport, Connecticut. This is like 10 years ago. And they've been able to maintain a presence in like the near uh, the adjacent building while they're getting all this money together to finally make the original building that was that was ordered by P.T. Barnum for his own stuff. And it's this beautiful uh, late 19th century building with a dome. The, the tornado actually turned the dome, which means that <laughs> it, which is not safe. So it's not safe for, for people now. But so Kathy, and I, I've worked with her on a number of projects and I've done book signings for her at the at the museum. And so she contacted me and said, Ken, we, we have this like continuing education series. We'd love for you to do one on things related to Barnum. And I said, well, the Cardiff Giant story uh, is the perfect example of that. That's uh, this fake giant fossilized man found in New York State in 1869. And along the way, Barnum had nothing to do with it originally. But when once he, once he sees that there's a lot of money being made, he actually offers – the people who were who owned it at the time, he offered them like thirty thousand bucks to buy it, so he could put it in his his sideshow. And when they turned him down, the son of a bitch had a copy made of it, like clandestinely <laughs> was able to make a mold of the original. And he starts, he actually starts advertising it as the real card of giant. And then they sue him, which is great because you know that's great publicity. And somewhere in my in a file, I have copies of the um, announcements in the New York Times for the fact that 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 uh, in the the sideshow of the circus at Madison Square Garden is the Cardiff Giant, and then the actual owners of the giant, the giants at this point is like an, being displayed in Albany, the real one. They they write a letter to the Times saying, "Damn it." That's not the we have the real one. It's coming to New York. And they actually if you look at a Google Maps, you look at the addresses of where they were being displayed. They were being displayed simultaneously about a block and a half away from each other in Manhattan, the real card of giant and the giant that Barnum was saying was the real giant, but it was not the real giant, it was a fake giant. And by all accounts, Barnum outdrew Barnum's fake outdrew the real card of giant. I mean, oh, g- given the nature of how they were created, I guess they're both blockbusters. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just can, can somebody ig- ignore. Smack, ignore. Can somebody smack Blake, right? Uh, uh, so, I, I guess. So, so can, go ahead. This is, this is one of the topics that you treat. Yes. The, the card that's, of giant. That's yeah. a chapter in the book. It's it's one of the lectures I, I give in the 10 part series. And it all started with this thing that I did for the for the for the uh, P.T. Barnum Museum. And I did one on on Sherlock Holmes. Anyway, when when Holly contacted me and said, well, you, Kenny, do you know anybody there who who does recordings? And I said, yeah, and these two guys who recorded me for. And again, those were those were cases in which I did them at home. And those guys and I sent those guys the PowerPoints and they recorded the PowerPoints and then they edited them into a really nice uh, couple of videos. So. I contacted 
Kathy. Kathy gave me their contact information. I contacted them, and they said, oh, we'd love to be able to do this. And so they came down to the house, and we did two or th- two at a time was doable. One time we did three uh, of mm. these hours. But you know what? It's like for me, it, w- it was just like in the old days when I would teach a couple of courses, have lunch and then teach another course in the afternoon. So it was it was great fun. They did a great job. Lots of cool uh, sound effects and whatever else. And and I really feel I mean, I know this is kind of sappy. I, I was joking of, of before, but it really means a lot to me that at least these in these 10 instances those lectures will, you know, knock on, knock on something, whatever the hell it is, knock on wood, uh, <laughs> will outlive me, and that maybe, who knows? It's the books and the lectures give me a a, a level of more immortality than I would not otherwise have. You know, what, and I know people are not supposed to talk about Woody Allen anymore, but it's a great line. <laughs> Woody Allen says. Uh, you know, some people want to achieve immortality through their works. I want to achieve immortality by not dying. Yeah, <laughs> but that's it's really not an option. So, so, yeah. so these are things that, that it, it makes me feel really good that there is this concrete, solid thing that people not only are are, are, are am I not restricted geographically? Well, it's the kids in my class get to hear me, but that anybody who wants to watch them on YouTube. Uh, can watch them wherever the hell they are, and 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 these things will again. If I hope they remain fresh and fun and interesting for people, well into the twenty fifth century. <laughs> well, I I'm loving the sound of this. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the other topics that you treat? Yeah, you betcha. And I always have to I have to look at my list because mm-hmm. I never remember. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so. The way we, we did them in no particular order, and I think that that's probably best. In other words, um, I don't. it doesn't make any goddamn difference if you watch – do the well, I'll watch Piltdown, and then I'll go to Atlantis, and then I'll look at rock art. It doesn't make any difference. However, there is a first or introductory, introductory lecture, which is sort of my chapter two in the Frauds book, my epistemo- epistemology chapter, which – I have gotten feedback on that chapter, how you do science, archaeology is the example. And I've actually heard from people who have taken, you know, they they apply to the publisher and make photocopies of just that chapter. And it's taught in like philosophy classes and engineering classes because it's a, it's a cool topic. Archaeology is really cool, but it also is a reflection. It's a model of how science proceeds all together. So, so, so the, the, if there's a first episode, that first episode is all about, hey, look, how, you, how do you know what you know? Yeah. And I use – because I'm a Sherlock, Sherlockian, right? I use Sherlock Holmes as an example of – here's a detective. He investigates the scene of a crime. How does he do that? Archaeologists investigate the scene of a life – and we use a lot of the same techniques and procedures. In fact, in uh, one of the stories, uh, The Adventure of Silver Blaze, a horse goes – a racehorse, value, val- valuables horse, goes missing, and the trainer of the horse, his body is found. He's found dead. And they, they call in Holmes, and there's a uh, – uh, the, the crime scene, the ostensible crime scene, where the, the, the body of the, the trainer was found. And the, the constable tells Holmes, yeah, we, I, we've gone over this – area very very carefully and Holmes says oh, it's fine let me let me take a look and he gets down on his hands and knees and he literally excavates through the soil and he finds a bird uh, he calls it a wax vesta which is just a, a 19th century version of a match a match head and he hands it to the uh, the the constable the constable is really annoyed oh, oh my goodness oh, we were just over this how did you find it and Holmes said, well, it's very easy. I found it because I was looking for it. Yeah. <laughs> that just mm-hmm. absolutely blows me away because I think, you know what? That's why archaeologists and folks who have no training in archaeology, that's the place we have to meet. Where you understand that with, a, with just like Sherlock Holmes, training and a wealth of experience – we know what we have to find in order to support a hypothesis that that what ancient Celts were sacrificing people in New Hampshire or Atlanteans were traveling across the ocean and giving people technology uh, and 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 uh, le- teaching them how to make calendars and how to make m- great monuments, uh, 
or the, the, the ancient Jews were in New Mexico and left a copy of the Ten Commandments. We know what must be there in order to support that hypothesis. And when, when Holmes found the wax Vesta, he already had a notion of what had gone on. He knew that that area where the body was found must have been illuminated, that something was going on there, and he had an idea. And so he knew that to support that hypothesis, you'd have to find something that indicated that, that, that the area had, had been illuminated. And so he was looking for that specific evidence. And sometimes if you're not looking for the evidence, you're not going to find it. And, and so what I do is I go through a whole bunch of ways in which archaeologists know how we know what we know. Uh, and it, it, is, it is the kind of stuff that is not necessarily intuitively obvious, mm -hmm. but if you take a course in archaeology, you go, oh, okay, I get it. That's how you know what you know. It's not It's not about – it really – archaeology is really not about just making shit up, which you hear online all of the time. No, mm -hmm. no, no. What we do is we – like as all scientists – we have an idea, we hypothesize something, and we say this is this is the kind of stuff that we have to find if that hypothesis is to be upheld. And if we don't find it, we, we put that hypothesis on a shelf. We say that's a cool story, but we don't have any support for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's the, the first one is that. Then I go on to some of the fun stuff, the Cardiff Giant Lecture, which is a ton of fun about how um, you know scientists <laughs> looked at this giant and they say, oh, come on, come on. This is a statue. It's made out of gypsum. Hasn't been in the ground for more than a year, and that didn't. That, that's a great object lesson in credulity and gullibility. Because even though scientists, um, O. C. Marsh, O'Neill C. Marsh, really famous paleontologist in the late uh, 19th century, Yale University. If you go to museums, th especially throughout the Northeast, and you go see dinosaur exhibits, the, there usually is a plaque saying, "Okay, this was excavated by O. C. Marsh." He was that big of a deal. And O.C. Mm. Marsh was called in to look at the Cardiff Giant. And he said, no, <laughs> no, that's, this is a statue. This exactly. Is a, <laughs> this is ridiculous. It's fake. <laughs> but nobody, nobody cared. Very few people cared. It did not cut back on people's interest in going and seeing the giant. And it was only really uh, six months after the thing was discovered that the guy who pulled it off, the, the, this uh, George Hall, uh, he he confessed to a newspaper reporter. Yeah, I did it. I had a block of gypsum, purchased it in Iowa, sent it to some Chicago stone cutters. They made the giant. They shipped it east. Me and my cousin Stub Newell. Stub is that a great name for a farmer in the 1860s in New York? Stub. Um, I always t I tell students this because I read it someplace that some people claimed it was a result of of a. Uh, one of Stub Newell's anatomical deficiencies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not saying anything. I don't know if that's the case. But, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, he confessed. The, the thing is that they, they brought it on the road. I have, listen, I don't know how, how long we want to go with this, but when I was, uh, this is in the 80s sometimes, I did, at, some, at some point, I did an interview for on um, History's Mysteries, which was back when the History Channel wasn't focused on the stuff it's focused on today, they did a week of famous historical hoaxes. They did one on the uh, Piltdown. They did one on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And they did one on on, uh, on the Cardiff Giant. Um, this is the one where they were asking me to, to – they wanted a sound check. And instead of me going – you know, testing one, two, three. I said, well, if you want to define this card of giant in the sentence, he was a giant naked guy. And, <laughs> and the thing is, I told all my friends, all my relatives, oh, you got to watch the history of mysteries. And they watched it. And God damn it. After every commercial, when they would come back, you, if you listen carefully, you could hear me saying in the background, giant naked guy. <laughs> so I did I did a lecture. I did a lecture for a local skeptics group and they didn't pay me, but I got like a rubber chicken for dinner and, and they gave me a t shirt that said, Ask me about the giant naked guy. I don't wear that in public because I mm. Tech, you know, personally, I don't want anybody coming up to me. Saying, yeah, tell me about the giant naked guy. <laughs> no, no, thank you. I don't want to. Oh. So that's that's just real. That's fun. And I wanted 
you know, people to have at least one example of something that was just just silly. Um, there's another one on Pilta, which is a hell of a lot more serious because that's an example where scientists too, scientists are people. And yeah, we, we screw up and some of us are dicks and some of us are inflexible <laughs> and some of us are are easily fooled when we see something that we want to believe uh-huh. in. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. The previously uh, desired outcome. And the whole thing about Piltdown was, number one, England had no ancestors. There were no, there were no, the fossil evidence of human evolution was from Germany. It was in Spain. It was in France. Uh, it was even in, on the island of Java. And literally the, the British were effectively evolutionary uh, you call them evolutionary bastards they had they had, they had no ancestors there were no in fact a, a french paleontologist uh, described english human paleontology as mere pebble collecting cuz that's all they got they got rocks they don't have bones and so when when you know the charles dawson and arthur smith woodward who was dawson was just this guy he was a a a, 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 a collector an amateur collector and uh, but he was really good at finding stuff, which turns out a lot of it he found because he planted it. Uh, but he got a, a scientist, Arthur Smith Woodward, an ichthyologist at the British Museum, to come and take a look. And they excavated the site. They found all kinds of evidence of this this fossil that was very human like skull, human like cranium, but a very ape like jaw, and that this was. Ultimately, the 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 human ancestor that everything else came from that that Neanderthals were an evolutionary offshoot, and all these other Java man again that was that was something that died off. But the real ancestor, the root of the human evolutionary tree, was right here in England. So people accepted that they embraced it because it was what they wanted to believe. And it wasn't until my God, that was the 1910s, and the, it wasn't until the 1950s that technology had developed enough that people could actually assess. And, and say, you know what, the skull is modern, 500 years old, and the, the 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 jaw is of an orangutan, for God's sake. Cool thing about that is that even very recently, within the last 10 years, they were able to extract DNA from the mandible, the lower jaw, and in fact mm-hmm. have proven that it's it's an orangutan jaw that was doctored to make it look like it belonged to the very modern-looking cranium. The cool thing is, in our archives, if you want to hear more, obviously, first of all, go to the news stuff. Go to YouTube and check out his series. Uh, but also, we did a deep dive on the Cardiff Giant. And we did another yes. episode where we, we, we touched on Piltdown. I don't remember if it was the whole episode. We definitely talked about that a good bit. And and I what we haven't talked about, but you've mentioned here, I think briefly, talk about epistemology just a little bit. Because I think it's fascinating uh, and super important because I think a lot of arguments come down to you're not really discussing the points. What you're really getting at is you guys have different bases for how you know things. In the uh, the episode, I go through all of the things that are that this is not how no, this is not how science works. So it's a lot of it is look these 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 steps that people are taking. Understand that's not the way science works, nor is it the way that science can work. And I think the biggest the biggest problem I see in epistemology for all sciences is this. And I, I wonder if it stems from the American tradition of a jurisprudence in which a person is innocent and your job is to prove them guilty. But that otherwise the assumption is they're innocent. And I think people think, well, well new ideas, new claims, new speculations – it's it's your job. If you're a scientist and you're skeptical, it's your job to disprove them because we are we're going to accept them because, you know, because somebody somebody said it out loud and we like it. And, you know, you guys, you prove the negative. And that's that's not the way science can work. Nobody. If somebody were to say, hey, look, if you you know, if you gargle apricot ground up apricot uh, pits, it'll cure your cancer. Well, nobody's going to say, okay, well, I'll just do that because uh, uh, you have to prove me wrong. I think most people at that kind of existential moment would say, well, is there any evidence that this thing works? Mm-hmm. And that's, the, that's the, the smart thing to do is to ask for the evidence that it actually has an impact, actually works. And not just say, well, I'm going to blithely go around doing this and, and forget, what, forget chemo and forget radiation and forget all of those other modalities of, of treatment, but I'm going to gargle apricot pits because somebody said it works. That's not the way science can work. Uh, 
So if you say, well, look, there were there was an, an ancient civilization 12,000 years ago that bequeathed its knowledge to all of the known civilizations from thousands of years later, we don't just say, OK, cool. OK, that's it. And now we're going to try to disprove it. It's the job of the claimant. The burden of proof is always on the person suggesting the hypothesis. And, and, and folks, I think folks don't understand that. I think folks also don't understand that the uh, you know, a, a lot a, a lot of, of the pseudoscience that I see has an overabundance of question marks in there in there there are very few um, definitive statements. It's all question marks. You read any of Eric Mondonikin's books, even the title of Chariots of the Gods has a question mark at the end of it. And there's an old there's an old saying in uh uh, journalism that any statement in a newspaper article that ends in a question mark <laughs> the, the answer that means that it's bullshit you know <laughs> that the answer is no this is bullshit we don't have any evidence for it and they get away with it by saying well i, I never said it i just wondered about it yeah the, 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 I, the yeah. just asking questions i uh, the jaq which I love. Yeah. Someone came up with uh, jacking off, jaqing off, which I friggin' <laughs> cannot get out of my head. I just think it's so funny. So, <laughs> so but but and, and but again, that's that's I see that very often as a defense. Why do you guys? Why do you guys care? He's just asking questions. Uh. Yeah. But that's like you know. Again, if you if you if you take the model of a, a court case. Uh, a, a prosecuting attorney can't say to a guy who's, you know, been conv- been accused of embezzlement. So, do you enjoy beating your children? Yeah, <laughs> you can't say. Well, I was just asking the question. I, I, I don't know. Obviously, that's that would be inadmissible in a court. But that's not in the newspaper. Yep. Yeah, in the courts <laughs> of science as well. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing is, and I get this a lot from folks, and I understand it. I empathize with this. You're not foolish to say this, which is, um, but isn't it possible? This is what what a complete dick I am. All right. <laughs> so a, a bunch of years ago, I did a, a, a talking head piece for an independent uh, film called "The Dragons of Jim Green." It is a it's a lovely little film. Um, this guy Randy Sallow, who was the director, the producer, um, the recordist, uh, he wrote the music for it. He, it, good guy. And Randy called me up and said, "Look, I've got this guy Jim Green, and I think it was North or South Carolina, and he believes he's an older man, and he believes that he has found evidence of a thirty million year old civilization on his property." Of intelligent, he called them reptiloids. So you know, All right? Okay, cool. <laughs> and he asked. He said, "Look, Fader, I, I got your book. I know you're a skeptic. I would like to interview you." I said, "Sure." He came over to the house. Now, here's I buried the lead here. Randy <laughs> Snello, Jim Green was his grandfather. Oh, he basically grew up on the old dude's property, and. And, and he was like a father to him. And, and in the, I never got to meet Jim Green. And he's passed away since. Um, but in the video, he seems like an incredibly sweet and sincere guy. Nice fella. But he's wrong. He's just, you know, he's just wrong. So at one point, Randy literally sits me down and says, yeah, but Ken, Kenny, isn't it at least possible? <laughs> and my response was, I said, look. I don't like your question because if I say no categorically, it's not impossible. I come off as, you know, a hard, hard nosed skeptic. I have a closed mind. But if I say it's possible and you just cut it there, mm-hmm. because really, Randy, it's possible in the same sense that it's possible that as I'm sitting here, a pig will fly out of my asshole. And and those are about you know, the possibility that there were reptiloids 30 million years ago uh, visiting houses of prostitution in South Carolina is about the same likelihood as a pig flying out of my asshole. Now, to, yeah. to Randy's credit, Randy didn't get mad at me. In fact, in one of the 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 uh, like the ads 
for that video. You could find just that that section of it saying, oh. see Dan Vader talk about pigs flying out of his asshole. <laughs> it's available online. So anyway, I talk about that. I talk about Atlantis. Uh, there's an Ancient Aliens episode. There's an episode about Native American rock art that's been misused and abused. There's an episode about epigraphy, about written messages uh, in, in North America, especially that where the claim is, well, these are ancient ancient Israelites or ancient Celts or ancient mm-hmm. Phoenicians or ancient Egyptians who visited America. And Karen, you, you do know, of course, that there somewhere in Australia, there's a fake Egyptian writing, f- fake hieroglyphs in some state park that to this day, there are people claiming, oh, the Egyptians got to Australia, even though. The oh, co- I'm not aware of that. I'm going to have to go and check that out. It's the Gosford glyphs or something like that. Gosford, I, okay. Yeah, that's not too – I mean, that is a bit of a distance from, from where I'm going to, but uh, yeah, might be possible. Oh, I have to check that out. And unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap things up, but, and I think our listeners are going to go, have to go and check out this series. Yeah, absolutely. It's, we'll uh, link in the show notes. Yeah. Fantastic. But we just had one last question. We sure. wanted to ask you what you're working on next. You're always working on something fascinating. Well, the thing I'm working on right now, well, we've got the 11th edition of Frauds is in the hopper. But my big new project for Princeton University Press, and there's no working title yet, uh, although the thing is basically written, is uh, a popularly oriented book about the archaeology of North America, prehistoric archaeology. So oh, there's about the it. mound builders and the cliff dwellers and rock art and uh, the the paleo, the, the original settlement of the New World. So it's kind of sort of geographical and temporal, but it's kind of the the you know the history of the world part one. It's the the history of North America of native people. And it's been a ton of fun working on that thing and it's right now. I'm waiting for some feedback from the press, and then we're going to get going on that probably in September. Everybody should look look for that sometime in 2025, I guess. Excellent. Assuming we're all still here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Oh, thank you so much for for joining us today. They are really excited about this new series, and you, and you really sprung it on us. Think about it. I didn't know if I was supposed to like tell people about it beforehand, so I kind of waited until it was ready to go. Monster Talk. You've been listening to Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. I'm Blake Smith. And I'm Karen Stolzner. You just heard an interview with Dr. Ken Fader about his new web series on archaeological frauds and hoaxes. Check out the show notes for links or go to YouTube and search for Fader Exposing Hoaxes and it'll take you right to them. And be sure and check out Ken's books the latest of which is about 40 alleged archaeological mysteries and oddities, which make a great companion to his previous book of 50 archaeological sites that you should see before you exit this place. Karen and her family are back in Australia for a few weeks, and as a reminder, we'll be bringing our partnership with Airwave Media to a very amicable end shortly, so your feed might see some changes. But remember, you can always find the latest episodes and the correct podcast feed information over at monstertalk.org. So if anything hiccups or you don't see episodes when you expect to, check there for guidance on how to get it fixed. Monster Talk's theme music is by Pete Stealing Monkeys. And we appreciate your taking the time to download and listen, and we hope that you enjoyed your visit with us. If you did, why not share it with a friend? And if you don't have any friends, you still guide us. been a Monster House presentation.